um, that was uh, a really fortuitous first uh, presentation in some ways because uh, um, we're going to be talking about sort of a similar uh, picture really but from the other perspective. So the presentation that we're giving today is about um, a project called Viking VR which we did with um, York Museums Trust and uh, um, at a distance the uh, British Museum as well. Um, which is part of a bigger project at the University of York exploring the use of immersive technologies in a cultural heritage setting. Um, and what we're particularly interested in at the University of York is uh, beyond the sort of um, the thrill and the novelty of immersive technologies, which is still sort of at its zenith at the moment, but is probably going to be on the wane soon and to uh, reduce what do these technologies really offer to cultural heritage institutions and how um, can we use immersive technologies to achieve the goals of uh, the museum more effectively. So that's sort of the underlying story and if we have time today we'll talk about projects which are following on from this one. So this was one sort of intervention um, out of uh, uh, several which are now ongoing with different partners but it gives a good snapshot to the kind of work we're doing. Um, so here we are. Um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the goal of this entire project if you like is to communicate complex uh, collections um, and uh, also in this case complex landscapes as well. So we've got um, uh, up here the beautiful sunrise at Torxey in Lincolnshire, which is just north of East Anglia. And it looks like a, a field now, uh, but at one point uh, in the late 9th century, it was a um, Viking encampment, uh, one of the biggest settlements in Britain while it was there. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But the evidence for this having been here primarily looks like this. So this isn't the... Um, this isn't material from this site, but it's material from nearby, from the Vale of York Viking Horde. And it's small items of metalwork, and the reason for this is that the preservation of metalwork is relatively good compared to other artefact types, but they're also much more discoverable, because through metal detecting, we're able to uncover these things. Um, and as part of this exhibition here, uh, which was at the Yorkshire Museum in York, um, we wanted to explain how it is that specialist archaeologists are able to take material like this and then tell very expansive, very convincing uh, and very meaningful stories about specific moments in time, um, which to uh, all of us as archaeologists in the room is probably second nature to a certain extent, but to members of the general public presents a considerable challenge. So if you show them a button or a coin, how is it you're able to tell so much from that? Um, and in the case of uh, Torxey and Lincolnshire, we're able to tell an awful lot. So this is a Viking camp, and there's all sorts of metalwork finds found here, but no physical evidence at all now. But it was, at the moment, uh, it was occupied by the great Viking army, one of the, uh, as I said, most significant settlements in Britain. And you can see the important role. So it's just uh, up here, next to where it says North Sea. Um, and you can see the important role that it had in the Viking settlement of northeastern England and then the growth of Viking influence in the British Isles more generally. And um, we know from the chronicles that uh, the camp was there. It's only recently been discovered by our colleague Julian Richards, who's a co-author on this presentation. Um, and we also know from various chronicles across Europe that this was a real trading hub for the one winter when it existed, and from the Frankish chronicles, we know that people were coming as far up from as far away as the French coast up the channel to trade with uh, the Vikings, despite the fact they were only here for the briefest of times. Uh, and so it really was this uh, extremely important place, but a place which now has almost vanished from the um, easy to understand archaeological records. So we don't have remains, there's no standing architecture, we just have these objects. So we uh, were commissioned effectively as a research group by the Yorkshire Museum to uh, design um, a digital 
intervention, a digital uh, installation, if you like, which would help to tell this story, the story of this place, which is very close to York, but which is very difficult to understand now. And as part of this uh, design brief, uh, they asked us to consider these things. Uh, and they said we could use whichever technologies we liked, uh, but it needed to be these things. So it needed to be innovative and experimental and attractive to new audiences. It needed to be accessible, so um, it needed to be something that a large proportion of visitors could enjoy and would be attracted to using. Um, it needed to be social, which is a real uh, problem for a lot of digital technologies, which tend to be for single users only. It needed to add to our understanding of I think, archaeology in Britain. And then also, uh, somewhat, mm, it's a, somewhat more complicated, uh, contribute to the museum's digital leadership agenda. So we're not, just work, we're not just designing cool things for museums here. We're having to think about policy. We're having to think about future funding and how the kinds of um, innovative work we do will actually feed into ongoing collaborative relationships and will enable the museum to uh, share its expertise with other institutions in the region. Um, so this is what we began with and um, the way that we did this as, a, as an institution at the University of York looked something uh, like this in our brains but this at least gives you a sort of idea of um, uh, who was involved. So we had uh, collaborations here between the heritage industry, uh, the university, which wasn't just archaeology, but also electronics, computer science, theatre, film and television and English, all, all uh, contributing different parts of this project and contributing to the discussion, but also um, help and advice from the creative industries as well. So it won't surprise any of us to know that the experts in developing virtual reality technology don't all work in archaeology. They tend to work in the uh, games industry and the digital uh, media industry and in Yorkshire we're very lucky to have um, a real concentration of people working in these industries so we also talk to them and I think there's always a risk um, and as I'm talking at an archaeology conference I can say this um, that archaeology can get lost in this mix I mean you might produce something which is absolutely spectacular but where is the archaeology where's the integrity um, as an archaeologist but I think the argument that we want to make today and I hope we can prove this um, and Nicole is going to be talking, giving the second part of the presentation where we talk about the evaluation and the impact of our work on uh, the public. I hope we can demonstrate that archaeology is able to make a unique contribution, not just to digital storytelling for archaeology within cultural heritage institutions, but to the way in which we think about immersive technologies or digital media more broadly as part of our uh, shared culture. And I think archaeology, well, I know archaeology has this long history of um, innovation in the use of media and of uh, it, we really punch above our weight in terms of defining how digital media are used more broadly uh, within our uh, uh, shared culture and I think there's every reason to hope that that will be the same as we move into um, an era of interactive media and immersive technologies as well. Um, in reality though of course it looked a lot more like this. Um, lots of tea, lots of glue, lots of things stuck to hands and um, this will give you a clue as to where we went with this project as will the title of the presentation which was to develop um, a virtual reality project but rather than trying um, to take our HTC Vive or our Google Cardboard and put it into an exhibition and see what happened we decided to take a step back and to actually think about what virtual reality hardware would have to look like if it was going to be useful within a museum setting and you can get a clue from uh, the uh, photograph here of what we concluded which was that it needed to be built like an absolute tank and um, this is in fact uh, a Google Cardboard effectively the internal geometry is the same, um, but the uh, uh, whole thing is made, made out of uh, sheets of uh, laser cut plywood. And you'll see what the result looks like in the end when people are actually using it. But this was the construction process. And the reason we went for um, immersive technology was twofold, really. One was that it really fitted the bill in terms of what the museum wanted. It's uh, an exciting mode of storytelling, and it's an exciting 
uh, medium in which to work when generating narrative, primarily because no one really knows yet how to tell stories in virtual reality. Um, and uh, that sort of sounds like a big statement to make, but this is one of the benefits of working with colleagues from across the university. And they were saying from their point of view as a research project, one of the most exciting things about this is that no one has produced, you know, the Jurassic Park of VR yet. We don't really know what a media blockbuster in VR is going to be. Uh, is it going to be more like a movie? Is it going to be more like a game? Is it going to be something completely different that we haven't even thought of yet? No one's really quite sure. And so this provided an opportunity for research in that sphere to take place as well. So we weren't just conducting how do we tell stories for archaeology research. We weren't just, we weren't just doing how do we develop cool museums exhibit research. We were also conducting research at the cutting edge of um, uh, digital creativity and interactive media. And that was really key to uh, the success, ultimately, of the project, I think. And that will come through in what Nicole's going to say in a little while, that by innovating across the board, not just as archaeologists, not just as museum professionals, but also as people working in electronics and um, uh, interactive media and digital media design, uh, we were able to produce something genuinely new and quite impactful for people who experienced it. Uh, and one of our key um, sort of uh, creative influences in the project was a colleague of ours called Guy Schofield, who works in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television at the University of York. And his background is as an environment artist in the video games industry. Um, and so he introduced to us this concept of environmental storytelling. And he said, if you're going to give someone a 30 second experience of virtual reality in a museum setting, uh, which realistically is probably what we wanted given the numbers of people coming through the space and given the nature of the experience you want to give someone in a museum, uh, you don't necessarily want sort of five people sat in a corner for 25 minutes all playing a VR game on their own. Um, uh, immersive and uh, environmental storytelling seemed like the way to go. And for those of you who uh, haven't come across this, environmental storytelling is the idea that by placing someone into a context and by sort of planting things in this scene, you can communicate vast amounts of information without being didactic. You don't need to sort of be too explanatory. You can create an environment which uh, uh, catalyzes a response in the viewer and which causes them to think about certain things and to see things in certain ways and it really is a form of storytelling because by controlling the weather within a virtual reality scene by controlling how dirty things are or how clean they are by controlling how much stuff there is how many people there are and your view over a landscape you're able to tell a huge amount to uh, or able to produce a huge amount of information to a, uh, a participant but in a way which is quite easy for them to consume and understand and we did this through a series of vignettes uh, and sort of micro immersive <coughs> stories which were all based around a single set of objects which I'll quickly go through now in order to give Nicole a decent amount of time to talk about um, the next part of the research, the evaluation and the results. Um, so the first of these which I'm afraid they're not very visible here uh, was the um, a boatyard scene so I know there were several thousand people at Torxy this winter, and from that we know there were several hundred ships at least. They'd been at sea for the best part of a year, and then had chosen Torxy as a place to bring the ships because it was very well protected from storms in the North Sea. And there would have been a lot of maintenance, and this is testified to by the presence of these little bench bolts, which are the rivets that hold ship's timbers together, and they're scattered all along the river well, where the riverbank was, um, which shows us that people were mending ships. So effectively, there was a vast boatyard, just like uh, a boatyard today in many respects, present on the bank at this time. And that would have been an incredibly uh, compelling sight, and it's one of the rare opportunities we have as archaeologists to probably show something which is far more dramatic than the average person would actually assume. I mean, sort of seeing hundreds of Viking ships pulled up onto a riverbank at once, all being fixed by people with hammers banging away at timber, that's amazing. <laughs> Very multi-sensory. Uh, fine metalwork. So we know fine metalworking was actually taking place on site. We have all of these little uh, test pieces here which show that people were actually testing their tools, testing their stamps, 
and we're actually working while they were there. So we had jewellers working on site. So we wanted to show some of that craft and to put people into the jeweller's tent and see all of these fine things that we know about Viking metalwork actually there in front of them. And then trading, obviously they were doing a lot of trading. They'd acquired a lot of valuable things by this point, but they also needed a lot of things, uh, consumable things and food and uh, uh, various other things. And so um, we know from the metallic evidence of weights at the bottom and coins clipped up and cut into pieces at the top, that trade would have been a huge thing. And in this scene, this is one of the most interesting ones in some respects, we have um, people speaking, and this was what the Department of English contributed, Frankish, Norse and Anglo-Saxon together trying to understand each other and uh, very reminiscent of any market scene anywhere in Europe today. Um, and then finally, my favourite, Games Night. So we found, I think there were, there were multiple boxes like this of gaming pieces, and they were just the ones that were lost in the mud. So these Vikings were playing games non-stop. So we had a games night, and you're stood in front of a barrel, and there are drinks, and there's some other people playing over there, and your uh, friend has just gone off somewhere to do something, and you're just enjoying a very rare winter in Lincolnshire, uh, cool, uh, starry evening here. And so, yeah, different sides of Viking life. And it looked like this. So the immersive storytelling didn't begin with the VR. It began when you walked into a room that was dressed like a Viking tent and there was an immersive soundscape of all of these people talking and the seagulls and the banging of the ships and conversations taking place in multiple languages. And here is someone using one of the VR masks. Um, and now on the subject of mm -hmm. using, I'll pass over to you, Nicole, to uh, talk about the, uh, the impact of the work. Great. So we did quite a bit of evaluation of the um, VR. Uh, that's not good in terms. No, no. <laughs> yeah. um, and have a few kind of findings to share with you. But I thought I'd talk to you more um, about the um, the evaluation that we did. That was about people's experiences of the VR. So that's probably more useful if you're going to be going on and doing VR projects or you're involved in VR projects yourself at the moment. So the exhibition um, is quite large for the um, York Museums Trust. There's 85,000 visitors. Um, and the digital manager felt that there had been a 25% increase in what they'd expected for a paid exhibition because of the VR. So most of the press coverage that the exhibition had focused on the virtual reality. Um, and we were really lucky that that was picked up by quite a few national um, press bodies. Um, but we found that from the evaluation, a lot of people were coming specifically for the VR, and so it meant their expectations were much higher than if they'd just come across the VR as part of an exhibition experience. So people were already kind of coming in with their critical hats on because they'd come especially to see the VR and wanted to see how uh, a museum in the middle of a city had done it. So um, the, the kind of key thing that we found from the evaluation was that of the people who'd um, self-selected to leave comments, and we had about 500 comments, about 70% of them were first-time VR users. So from that, we're finding that people are coming to the museum and are accessing VR for the first time. Um, incidentally, of the 30% of people who had used it, half of them had used it in a museum or a school's context in the past. So that tells you about the kind of people that were visiting the exhibition. Um, so I've just kind of got some general uh, user feedback. We asked um, three different questions through our evaluation. So we did observation, we had comment cards, uh, we interviewed um, staff and volunteers who were on gallery space, and we were asking them about the user experience. So how did it differ from what people were expecting to find in a museum? Um, what would they change? What did they find rewarding? Um, but mostly for us as archaeologists, what was the difference between presenting archaeology through VR rather than using static images? Um, or video, and the user experience is all kind of part of that interactive, immersive, um, people reflecting on that. We were interested in content, so how did people's perceptions change about understanding the Viking world after they'd experienced the VR, and also uh, visitors' motivation, so um, how useful is the VR actually as a delivery method for archaeological findings, and how effective was it as a way for us to give people a way to experience the past. So as part of that kind of sensory experience of archaeology. 
So Gareth mentioned in the design process, we, one of the things that we wanted was for the, the actual process itself that we'd gone through to be repeatable within the museum's context. So we were careful to um, record everything that we did and we used a lot of human computer interaction methods to do that. And we kind of noted down all the decision making along the way. The way. Um, the, some, of, some of the main things that I think you probably didn't mention when you're talking about the design was that we were thinking a lot about things like um, we wanted the technology to be in the gallery space but not be supervised. Um, Gareth mentioned that the headsets themselves were designed around them not being um, small enough to fit into a handbag um, and also uh, disguising the fact they had Samsung phones inside them. So we wanted the digital technology itself to be, to be sort of invisible and not really part of the experience. In fact, that was then unavoidable because of the press coverage that the project got. Um, we didn't want any cues and we didn't want sign-in sheets. So the, the experiences themselves were designed to be very playful and very short. And as part of that, we didn't provide any guidance or information at all about what the actual objects themselves were. So people came into the room and had to work out themselves okay, how to use it. Um, lots of other things uh, <laughs> we found out. Um, but just the, kind of the main thing is um, that we found people were really kind of imagining the Viking... Um, uh, imagining themselves into the Viking scenes and were bringing stuff that they'd found in the rest of the gallery into their experience of the immersive technology. Thanks.